to our, our final deep dive um, in which uh, Professor Helliwell will take us through chapter two um, entitled World Happiness, Trust and Deaths Under COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be back with some, with some details. Uh, you, you see there the whole team uh, that have produced this chapter and the corresponding the year before under much greater time and content pressures uh, this time. Let's uh, avoid the time pressures by proceeding to the first slide. <clears throat> so this is what uh, is the official ranking uh, based on three-year averages. And you'll see it's familiar. Those of you who follow the World Happiness Report regularly will see that uh, we have the overall rankings uh, on the right. What's different between this and last year is very little. Uh, there is a 0.99 correlation between the rankings from 2018 to 2020 and from 2017 to 2019. One thing that's happened is for almost the first time, we have the first country statistically ahead of the other top countries. Uh, so Finland is not only uh, a gain at the top, but it's by a, a greater margin. We'll get back later on and see that this happiness was both supportive of and, and, and correlated with high success in handling COVID as well. Uh, let's go to the, let, let me just go through the six factors because we'll come back to them later. Uh, this shows the amount of, for each country that's explained by G. Let's go back to the first slide, please. Uh, by each country, by GDP per capita, healthy life expectancy, uh, generosity, social support, freedom to make life choices, and perceptions of corruption. Uh, and the rest of it is the value we call the value of, of happiness in dystopia, which is a mythical country that has the world's lowest values of each of those explanatory variables. And it also includes the, each country's residual because of course we explain these differences across countries, but we use people's own evaluations of their own lives to give the scores. Our analysis on the six factors doesn't determine those scores at all. It's the other way around. Second slide, please. So, uh, right at the very beginning, we wanted to see how uh, things were going under COVID compared to how they had gone before. So this takes the, for the 95 countries uh, that we so far have data on, we then rank them in terms of their subjective well-being. And then we take the same countries, the same 95 countries, and, and order them by their 2017 to 2019 uh, score. Uh, so you see, in, 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 in this case, uh, Luxembourg is missing from both because it didn't have a 2020 score. But you'll see, even with, even with this comparison, and the look at those figures in brackets, which are the confidence intervals, uh, and you see uh, that uh, with the uh, exception of Finland at the top, the differences among nearby countries are tiny. Uh, and uh, uh, the, for example, uh, Sweden and Norway, which is an interesting pair because Norway is always ranked higher than uh, Sweden. And here uh, in COVID times, uh, where the surveys in both countries were taken in April, uh, when uh, perhaps the Swedish easy touch uh, was easier, slightly easier to live under than the Norway uh, clearer one. It'll be interesting to see how those two nations compare next year, because as we'll see, they've had very different success in handling uh, COVID and their economies since that time. Next slide, please. There's supposed to be two maps there. There they are. The second one took. So here, here's just a map of happiness across the world using the 27 2019 data on one map and the 2020 on the other. This is another way of saying what I've now said four or five times that the rankings are very similar. And part of it is the countries that were at the very top turned out to handle uh, COVID pretty well, too. 
And uh, the differences across countries didn't change very much in any event. Two countries that's worth casting your eye on, however, that did change color as you move from 2019 to 2020 are two countries that together include almost uh, half the uh, world's population, India and China, both of whose uh, well-being scores rose significantly. In India's case, it was a reversal of a long-term decline that had been going on and a very welcome reversal it was. And the uh, other was in China uh, that in fact has found itself with uh, very few negative consequences uh, of, of anything during this year. Uh, towards the end of the year anyway. Next slide, please. Now, this is another way of saying we're going back. And now we're looking at individual level data uh, for all the people who computed, uh, contributed surveys in 2020. And we're asking uh, at the individual level, how do these variables rank? And you can see how important counting on friends is. There's a way in which that lines up with what Jan was saying about workplace belonging. It's one way of measuring uh, of belonging uh, and a sense of freedom to make your key life decisions. Very important institutional trust. This is not one of our regular ones, but we've added it in, used it in WHR 2020. Very important to, for people to have confidence in their governments for their general happiness, but we'll see later on, it's absolutely crucial in supporting their abilities to find successful COVID strategies. Donation is one, one measure we use of generosity, which you also find out is very important in, uh, in fueling a successful COVID strategy. And household income is, is there as well. And as others have mentioned, you can see that it's uh, relative importance to the social factors is, is much smaller. We, and perceptions of corruption uh, are also important. It's an alternative measure. And uh, you can see both confidence in government, which the institutional trust measure captures, and corruption, which is a measure of the absence of something bad. They both come through independently for individuals. And having a health problem, which is the equivalent at the micro level to the healthy life expectancy we use at the macro level, you can see is a very important predictor. These are things that don't appear in our regular graph because they're individual level variables. And we see below 30 and above 60, where the, the baseline is the people between 30 uh, and 60. And you can see there is this traditional U shape for this sample, the older end of the U shape is, uh, is, is not as large as it is in some studies. Um, but it's true in, in those 95 countries that those under 30 are systematically happier. Uh, and females here are uh, happier by the amount on the life satisfaction scale. Uh, that's pretty usual in these studies between 0.1 and 0.2. Now we show elsewhere in the chapter, but I hardly need to have a separate slide for us here, that these effects remained essentially the same in 2020 with some exceptions that are worth reporting. Uh, that those age 60 gained about two tenths of a point relative to those in the other two age groups uh, during uh, COVID. Um, the uh, gender difference did not alter. Um, that to link back to something we heard earlier about uh, from uh, uh, the social connections team about uh, people's women clearly spent more time doing uh, childcare than men during this period. And if there's no change in happiness, what's that's telling you? And there's some studies showing this, that time spent in childcare, in fact, is not regarded as a cost to life satisfaction. Um, uh, because of course the child care in question here especially may be helpful because it's care of your own children that uh, families that used to have to fight for quality time together uh, now had it forced on them and uh, many of them found on average they found that it was an advantage and not a disadvantage uh, so that helps to explain what otherwise might seem inconsistent that the male and female life satisfactions were equally well maintained the bottom coefficient COVID-19, we then said, all right, here's an equation that applies to all four years of data. 
if COVID came in as a really big hit on life evaluations, then you'd see the COVID-19 would be a big negative. As you can see, it's not a negative uh, at all. Next slide, please. Now, this is getting on to the linking section in the chapter because we're going to be one of the first things we did is said what what which of our main factors supporting happiness uh, in fact uh, were important for delivering success against COVID uh, and uh, we discovered that the main one and I'll get to this in a moment uh, was institutional and trust and social trust um, and uh, here we present some new research just to show how important trust is. But in particular, we're using a slightly more novel and interesting measure of trust where it's more than trust, it's about benevolence. Uh, people who think that they're like, their wallet would be very likely to be returned if discovered by the police or a neighbor or a stranger uh, those are the three alternatives offered in this version of the Gallup World Poll uh, sponsored by Lloyd's uh, Register Foundation. You could see that both of them are more important than a doubling of income and both of them separately together if, if you say uh, both police, neighbor and stranger as I mentioned in the first one and you enter them together, it's worth more than a full point on the income distribution. You can see the Lloyd's survey was set up with wallet return as a measure of negative risk, the risk of something good happening. Exactly the same question was asked about some bad things that might happen, how likely harm is from mental health issues. So people who think it's very likely to suffer mental health problems, they're uh, well-being, life satisfaction is lower by four tenths of a point, harm from violent crime, uh, 0.22, current unemployment, uh, 0.43. These are all major hits on your well-being, but you can see that none of them are as big uh, as this idea, the, the life satisfaction you get from living in a society where people care about each other. Now this links we've discovered before to all crises, because what crises do is give you the chance and in fact force you into a situation where you get to see how kind and benevolent and caring your neighbors are. Uh, and we'll see that that's a very big part of the total story. So let, let's go to the next slide. I can't spend, I don't need to spend very much time on this one because this is precisely the same picture that Jeff Sachs uh, showed earlier. Uh, and so it's telling you there's a huge range of death rates uh, from COVID across countries. Let's go to the next slide when we get into explaining it. Jeff talked earlier about a number of dogs that didn't bark. What we've done is put together a model explaining for 163 countries are trying to explain for 163 countries what determined uh, a success or failure in uh, controlling uh, direct COVID-19 death rates. And the uh, median age, which Jeff mentioned is, is uh, pretty well the most important of all, as he said. Being in a country that's an island is a help uh, in part because our, it isn't just talking about Australia and New Zealand, there are uh, 23 of them in this, uh, in, in this sample of 163. Uh, it makes it easier to control access and egress. And so it, if you've got a will, uh, it, it, the way is slightly easier. Uh, exposure to infections in other countries, that's also something that's less in Australia and New Zealand because of course they were physically removed uh, and the countries nearest to them were countries that had the pandemic relatively well, well controlled. So this is infections as they were at the end of March in nearby countries. So it's a gravity model based measure of 
how many sick people were near your borders. And if it was a big number, then that makes it harder for you to control. It doesn't mean it's impossible. So this isn't something that's uh, given to you as something you can't deal with. You can deal with it because it means it's more important to act on your own. Uh, for example, this exposure to infections, which explains a good part of the high death rates in Europe, that exposure was just as high for the Nordic countries as the other countries. And you find the Nordic countries, with the exception of Sweden, all had very low uh, death rates. And so they were able to apply, not quite to the same level as Australia and New Zealand, uh, but a strategy that was much more effective in controlling uh, infections. And we'll get on to see what that's based on very shortly. Now, Jeff mentioned uh, knowledge. How, did, how was it? He had some hypotheses about why would this, what was known from earlier pandemics not have been more readily picked up by others? And uh, secondly, why were people so resistant to uh, understanding the importance of asymptomatic uh, transmission when it uh, became obvious? Uh, and also the fact that the transmission was also um, by aerosols and hence the importance of masks. And uh, at, at Jeff wanted us particularly to look at uh, the SARS experience. And so we have two variables that do that. Uh, together, uh, if you just use either alone, it's highly significant. We sort of split it between the two here because um, they both have something to play. One was being in the WHO Western Pacific region, which had some documents that laid out this strategy very clearly and they were discussed among the countries in that region. Uh, people in the regional office shake their heads a bit about why this didn't get back to head office and become more of the standard global line faster than it did. And the other was the uh, uh, average distance from any between any country and the SARS countries and the idea that you might learn something from being closer to the countries that had had that experience. Another is female heads of government. It's been studied before in a number of other papers. And it's not just a story about the female leaders you might know. There are 22 of them in the sample. Um, and it's a, a material uh, change. These are, all, these are all in standardized betas, by the way. We, we have the actual coefficients in terms of the death rates uh, in the chapter as well. This shows the relative importance. Then institutional trust, here we are, that I've emphasized before. It's a, it's a mixture of people's assessment uh, to several answers about their confidence in their government actions. Uh, we don't have for this full sample of 163 countries a good measure of social trust. So what we did is uh, putting in the Gini coefficient of income inequality. And that's important because it has been shown in a number of countries that income inequality is linked to lower social trust, harder to maintain social trust in an unequal society and a more equal society <clears throat> in economic terms. This is uh, it, it, it's le less likely to arise when social trust is higher. So the causality goes both ways and it's a, it's a measure of of inequality. John Clifton earlier in this uh, show uh, said that well-being inequality is if more important than income inequality. And we too have found that when it comes to explaining subjective well-being. But we tested income inequality and well-being inequality in explaining death rates. And here it was the income inequality that had the more important role to play. And there are a number of studies that have shown that in a country with unequal income distribution, there are more people put down in high risk living conditions. Uh, and then it does make it more likely for them to, to suffer death as a consequence. So it's no surprise to us that income inequality is playing a double role here in giving you higher death rates for other reasons, as well as giving you higher death rates because it's, it's social trust is lower. And we're convinced, of course, that social trust is very important. Next slide, please. Now here we're getting to something that's actually going beyond the chapter. Uh, because we found that uh, 
since we did the major research, we are now able to put together what are called excess uh, death statistics. So it's the extent to which total deaths in a country in 2020 uh, exceeded their average in the three preceding years. Uh, and in almost everywhere, these were positive numbers. Uh, there were a few countries where they were not big numbers and e even negative. And you will remember some people have talked about there being a trade-off between policies tight enough uh, to reduce transmission to zero and what they would then do to people who would then be inclined to mental illness or suicide or a whole range or untreated cancers or a whole range of other threats to livelihood. In other words, were you purchasing uh, your reduction in COVID deaths by threatening lives, livelihoods and uh, lives and livelihoods uh, by an amount elsewhere. And uh, Richard Laird has already reminded you that in fact, the countries that suppressed COVID the best actually had better economic outcomes. So they were, wasn't, wasn't a trade-off with the economy. What we're showing here is there wasn't a trade-off. It wasn't that there just wasn't a trade-off with the economy. There wasn't a, even a trade-off with other deaths uh, because you see the countries in the Asia Pacific and we put Australia and New Zealand in the Asia Pacific group here. We put their COVID deaths there and that's the dark uh, bar. And then uh, we, we put in the total excess mortality uh, in those countries. And this is death rates per 100K, the, the notion that we've been using throughout here. Uh, and you can see that the areas that were least good at handling COVID were actually had even greater excess deaths from other causes. Let me help you through that if it's not entirely clear because it wasn't in the chapter. So in that sense, it's new to you today. Uh, the blue bars show total excess deaths. This is the extent to which deaths in 2020 have been higher than the three preceding years. And so it's, they've got to be traceable to COVID in some sense or another. Uh, and you could see that those who handled COVID direct deaths best also kept uh, the non-COVID part. You see the non-COVID part or the indirect COVID deaths is the right way to think about them is the difference between the height of the black bar and the height of the blue bar. And so that difference in terms of deaths is tiny for the Asia Pacific. Uh, it's in the middle ground in Western Europe, and it's much bigger in Central and Eastern Europe and Russia, and uh, especially in, in the Americas, where it's, it, that's driven, of course, in number of countries by uh, Latin America. So you could see that this, these new data are, are telling you that the costs of COVID to the kind of well-be calculations that Richard Laird was showing you before are in fact even greater than the ones he presented, which were based on the direct COVID deaths because these excess deaths in fact made it even more expensive not to control uh, COVID. And uh, we've then done some preliminary attempts to say what governed the international differences in the, in the uh, rates of indirect COVID fatalities. And there we found so far that among the things we've looked at, that having someone to count on in times of trouble uh, is very important, as is generosity. So it's saying the societies that have higher levels of social capital were better at stopping COVID, and they were also uh, much better at uh, pr providing other protecting populations against indirect COVID uh, deaths. And another way of looking at that is that's another way of saying why was it the Nordic countries did so much better than the rest of Europe, uh, Sweden aside. Uh, and uh, the answer is they had these high levels of social capital and they kept both direct deaths down, but they also had very low excess deaths in total. So they were able to get their low COVID direct deaths without cre creating a lot of deaths of other kinds in the country. Now, this was all done 
analysis is here is only for the 65 countries that we can get excess death statistics from thus far, but it's a very large chunk of world population. It excludes Africa, unfortunately, but it's telling you where this is going and it's only 2000. And as you well know, in a number of countries, the deaths but from the direct deaths from COVID since January 1 are 50% as large as their uh, deaths during 2020. So this uh, pandemic is by no means over and this analysis obviously will need to be fleshed out and continued. I think that's enough to give an overview of what's in the chapter if uh, my timing is okay. Thank you very much, John, for that uh, lovely presentation. Um, we are close to time, so I, I think I'll pose one question and then um, I will follow up with all the questions I've saved and, and, and direct them to you by email. Um, and I can try to do that for the other speakers as well. Um, but I think one question that I, I noticed um, came up earlier that is best directed to you, John, is um, what? how can we make sense of some of the data that, that seems to be conflicting in this year's report, perhaps about how um, we see nearly uh, very little change in happiness, um, despite the uh, life evaluations, despite the results on um, work and emotions? Well, uh, emotions play into life evaluations. We've always uh, seen that. A lot of the workplace, so this is uh, one, one way of thinking about it. If life's getting really bad for some people and the average isn't changed, there are other people who, if anything, are finding themselves better. There's a nice paper came out from Leonardo Bocchetti the other day uh, showing that even in Italy, one of the worst hit countries, there are a number of people uh, who are going up in their life evaluation scales. And they're the people who are taking and rediscovering a reality that it's the immediate social context that's very important for life evaluation. So these are people who aren't traveling the world. They're now rediscovering their neighborhoods. These are the people who didn't have time uh, to spend time with their children and now finding the family is reconstructed and working for them. Uh, so that a lot of these reworkings of work life are in fact helping people uh, to rediscover uh, I mean, it's, it's classic in, in our work. We thought it would have been a disaster because we know how important for well-being personal relationships are relative to Facebook friends. And now we find all we have are Facebook friends in a sense, and yet we're doing rather well with it. And the answer is, you know, the social media are becoming more social in their effects. And so that's all part of it. That, uh, and I think there's sort of essence of hope you see from several of the chapters that even the prospect of building back better is a sustaining feature because uh, having a purpose is very important, not in our equations because we don't have purpose data, but it's very important. There are a lot of people who are now brought into a situation uh, where their life really, other people really do rely on them and they have a purpose and not just in their workplaces, but in their families and communities. And that's very supportive and they have discovered that their neighbors are much nicer people than they thought they were, because that's what crises do. It put you in a situation where you rediscover the, the high levels of social capital where they exist, and that makes you happy. Well, thank you for that. I, I that um, proactively actually addressed a couple of the other questions and speaks to many of the themes in the report. So what an appropriate place to end. Um,